And you can open your Bible to Genesis chapter 1. Today we're going to be talking about men, fathers, dads, men. And the question that we're going to try to answer today from the Bible is what does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a man? man? Now again, this is a great reminder as you look at the stage to, to pray this week for what's going to happen here this week, which is VBS, okay? So make it a prayer concern. Um, this week, um, you saw the energy in that last song, My Lighthouse. That was a song from last year's VBS. Um, just imagine, uh, it probably about four or five times louder and crazier and with more energy. And that's sort of what we do uh, each day here at VBS. And this place will be filled with upwards to 200 kids. Keep praying that more kids come. I know that our VBS staff doesn't want to hear that, but we need more kids to be part of this. So keep praying and pray for those kids that will be here this week. And, and do one favor for me if you think of it this week. And uh, you can let me know or let Pastor Danny know or maybe drop it in that blue box back there. But what I, I'd like you to do is look at these two things here, this tree and this, this beautiful rock display, and figure out which one you think is more impressive. Which one you think is more impressive? Just put that out there. Which one you just think really, uh, really sets off the RVBS time? And let me know if it's the tree here or, or this, this pride rock here with the lion on top of it. So, you know, you could do that or not. But that's just, that's just something fun that you can do. All right. What does it mean to be a man? That's our question for today. What does it mean to be a father, a husband? What does it mean to be a man? Uh, you can see from the picture I chose to open our time together, is, is you may no, go no further than, than June 6th. You know, uh, last uh, June, this last June 6th, just a, a few uh, weeks ago, a few days ago, we celebrated the 75th anniversary of D-Day when uh, we stormed the beaches of Normandy and upwards, and the, the numbers are not exact. I tried to find the right number, but they don't know, but upwards to 5,000 American men died on that one day on those beaches. And you may say, you don't have to look further than that. That's what a man is. That's what men do. Men sacrifice their lives for those that they love. Men stand up for what is right when everyone else is, is crumbling for what is wrong. Men step up, and if they have to die for what they believe, and they're willing to do that. And today, 2019, the same age men that 75 years ago stormed those beaches are the same age young men that now go to college and demand safe spaces because words hurt them. I'm not exaggerating. That's the culture. That's the, the change in 75 years that we've seen in our culture. We live in crazy times. Crazy times. Read the news. Look at your reports. Just the last few weeks, I, I sort of pick out different things I see in the news that really uh, are astounding. One of the things I saw the last week is a 12-year-old boy named Desmond he is a transgender. He, his mom says he chose his gender and his sexuality at age two. Two years old, he made the decision that he was going to be a girl, and he was going to be a, a drag queen girl. And he's one of the most famous drag queens, 12 years old. He dances for men in strip clubs for money. 12 years old, this is what's happened. Desmond is amazing. You can Google it. This is our, this is our culture that we live in. This isn't Russia. This is America. This is what's happening. Headline news in the New England Journal of Medicine. I'm not a doctor, but I've heard that's a pretty prestigious journal. The New England Journal of Medicine had a headline, and it is the headline. Man gives birth to stillborn baby. This is in a medical journal. I, I'm not a doctor, again, but men do not give birth. I, I, you don't need to be a doctor to figure that. But there we are in one of the most prestigious journals uh, in America. This, this man, this woman came in who was like a man and demanded to be treated as a man with stomach pain, abnormal pain. And by the time they got around to treating it, they realized this wasn't a man, this was a woman. And this woman was pregnant. And, and the time it took, the, the baby died because, again, she was a man with stomach pain, not a woman giving birth. Last week, New York State changed its birth certificate to have another gender. You can mark it as... Uh, male or female or other. I don't know what a pediatrician would do with that. You come in, what, what your child, other. What, other, well, what do I do? I don't know what to do with that information. A new group, a new group that, that, that I, I have found is a group called the, the NULOs, N-U-L-L-O, and these are young men who surgically remove all their genitalia. They're, they're nulos. They've be chosen to be like a eunuch. They've chosen to be asexual, to be completely non, 
sexual at all. This is a, a growing group in our world. This is demonic. This is crazy. This is sinful. You know what this is? Again, I don't want to sound like an alarmist, and maybe you think I do, but this is what we are witnessing the destruction of our very culture right now. We are witnessing the destruction of our nature, our, 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 excuse me, our nation, our culture, our society. We are seeing the destruction of the evangelical church in America, and, and we're seeing the destruction of, of family and what it means to be family. This is all happening on our watch, in our generation, in this day and age. And the first thing on this Father's Day I want to point out to you, the first thing that is destroyed in all of this is the foundation of all of this, which is biblical masculinity. Satan knows that if he can pull out this one piece, which is what it means to be a man, everything will crumble on top of it. Everything in our culture and world is founded on the foundation of what a, uh, what a man is. Our families, our marriages, our churches, our culture, our nation is founded on this basic principle, this foundational principle of what a man is. If Satan can pull that out, the rest will collapse upon itself, and that is what we are seeing. God has designed humanity to live in what is called patriarchy. This is a God-given biblical principle of patriarchy. It's not a bad word, although you hear it as a bad word. That is the mandate that we see in Genesis throughout the entire Bible. This is the way that God has ordained and commanded that humanity is to function on the foundation of what it means to be a man, a father, a husband. And that's what's crumbling around us. So if we can restore this, the biblical mandates of what it means to be a man, if we can restore this and live this out, It'll have that same ripple effect in a positive way that it now has in a negative way. So that's what we're going to try to do today. It's a big task we have before us, but we're going to start. And if you, you want to find out what it means to be a man or a woman or what God's original design was, you need to go back to the beginning so you can open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. You know, you get in the first page, table of contents, flip it over in the beginning, chapter 1. This is where we see God's design for marriage, for family, for culture, for society, for nations, for our sexuality. It's all here in Genesis in these first chapters, and this is where we will be today. But before we get going too much further, let's go ahead and pray and ask the Lord to bless our time today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the opportunity and the privilege and the joy it is to be in your house, to be among your people, to hear your word taught and preached, to sing your praises to be able to give back a portion of the blessing that you've given to us, to pray together, to fellowship together, to commune with one another. Lord, it is a good day when we are here on your day to worship you. And I pray that every heart, every, every soul, every mind that is here today would be touched by you and touched by your Holy Spirit's presence, that you would work in our lives, that you would meet us where we are. If we are... Um, unsaved, if we don't know you as our good Father, as our Lord and Savior, may today be the day of salvation. If we know you and have walked with you for years and years, may today be a day of strengthening and encouragement. Uh, if we're uh, backslidden and we're struggling in sin and we've turned away from what you want, may today be a day of rebuke and challenge for us. May we step up, may you work, especially on this Father's Day, in the heart of our men here the heart of our fathers and, and husbands and young men and, and, and boys here today, Lord, that you might instill, on us, instill in us the biblical mandates for manhood today. That we may not be toxic males, but we also might not be absent males or effeminate males, but we may, be the, the, may fulfill the God-given biblical role that you've placed before us in faith and with courage, Lord, that we might lead our wives and our families and our children and our churches, and we might impact this world for you, Heavenly Father. So, Lord, I pray especially for our men today, and I pray a special blessing upon them, Lord, that, that we would leave encouraged today in the roles that you've assigned to us, that you've created in us, and that we might step up and we might fulfill those roles, Lord. And we know that if we do that, we will impact not just our family, not just our marriages, not just our church, not just our community and neighborhoods, not just our, our, our nation or our culture. We might impact this very world for you, Lord. It's a big task but it's one that you've given us and you've empowered us for. And I pray that we would fulfill it, Lord. Challenge us today, I pray in your name, amen. Amen. So you can see we have a large task before us today. And 
we're talking to men, it's Father's Day, but certainly the principles that we're going to talk about are, can apply to, to all Christians today, but with a specific emphasis on men today. And some of what I'm doing here, if you were at the men's retreat, we had a few uh, months ago in April, um, I'm using some of the same themes that we talked about on, at the men's retreat if you were there. We based our men's retreat on, on 1 Corinthians 16, 13 to 14, which says this, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men. Be strong, let all that you do be done in love. Act like men, act like what God has said a man is. And again, to, to know how to act as a man, as a husband, as a father, you have to go back to the beginning. You have to go back to Genesis. And we're going to look in Genesis chapter 1 through 3, and we're going to see five pictures, if you will, five pictures of what a, a godly man looks like, what God designed men to be and to do. And we're going to see them right from Genesis. And we know that this certainly plays out to, to where we are today. These, these principles, these truths are as important to us today as the day that Adam received them from his creator in the Garden of Eden. So let's dig right in and start with the first one. Number one, uh, men are created in God's image. We are image bearers. Women are created in God's image and are image bearers. We bear the image of God. It's stamped upon us. His likeness, his image is ours. Look at chapter 1 of Genesis, starting at verse 26. Then God said, and remember, this is right out of the gate. Think of how quickly this comes. 1-1, one, one, in the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. He creates the, the, the earth, and we know the story. And right on the tail end of that, he begins with what it means to be a man, what it means to be married, what it means to be a human, what, what human sexuality is, what all these things are. Right, right in the beginning. This is it. Then God said, let us make man, mankind, in our image, after our likeness. There you see the Trinitarian God speaking in a plural, our likeness, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Yahweh, Jehovah. Let's make mankind in our image and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man, Elohim is the word there, created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. We are made in the image of God. This means, well, this means a lot of things, but it means specifically a couple things. Number one, it means that God is the only one who gets to define who you are. Only God determines who you are. No one else can do that. Not even you. You don't, you don't have the right or the privilege or the power to define who you are. God, your creator, that's for him to decide. You don't decide it. Your feelings don't decide. Your own thinking doesn't decide. The world certainly doesn't decide who you are. God, your creator, has made you in his image, and he says and defines and determines who you are. God does. This means that men and women are both created in the image of God. We are both equal in God. We are created in God's image, but we are created different, and we reflect God's image differently. That's a good thing. It's a really good really good thing. We should celebrate that we are both made in God's image and we should celebrate that we've been made differently. We are not the same. That makes life a lot worth living than if we were all the same, doesn't it? Men and women are equally in the image of God, but we are different and we should celebrate our differences, not try to be exactly the same. This is the world that we're living in. We're trying to say that there is no difference in the genders. There is no difference between men and, and women, that we're interchangeable. We're just the same. We are not the same. That sounds so obvious to say. Sounds so stupid to say, but we have to say that in our day and age. We are not the same. We're different all sorts of ways. We're different biologically. Gender is fixed. You need to hear this. Gender is binary. Gender is unchanging. It's fixed. You can't change your gender. You may struggle with that. Sin does that, and we need to be sensitive to people like that. But God has made you the way you are, male or female. It says it right there, Genesis 1, 26. It doesn't get any more foundational, basic, right from the beginning. Male and female, he created them. I went on the internet to a place where I often get my, my, uh, my uh, dictionary, where I often get definitions, dictionary.com, and this is how they determine gender. It says, either male or female division of a species, especially as differentiated by societal or cultural roles and behavior. A similar category of human beings that is outside the male or female binary classification that is based on the individual's personal awareness or identity. That is a lie. That is not right. That is not true. Your gender is not determined by your personal awareness or your identity. 
It's not. I'm sorry. It's not. And again, we realize that we live in a world where people are confused about these things, but we got to go back to the Bible and say what the Bible says. The first rule, if you want to change anything this radically, basically gender, how we think about gender, the first rule in that is you need to confuse people about gender, you need to disorient them about gender, and you need to redefine words. Confuse people, get them confused about what gender is and how it works. Do you realize that as human beings, the first thing you learn and realize about a person is their gender? It's the first thing you you realize and you learn about it, and it is the last thing you will ever forget about a person is their gender. It's that basic. There is probably no one in your life, in your distant memory, years and years ago, that you can remember, and you don't remember if they're male or female. You may forget their name, you may forget what they did for a living, you may forget everything about them, what they look like, where they were from, anything about, but the one thing you will never forget is whether they were male or female. Remember that guy? Oh, man, we grew up with him. He was that crazy guy. You, you, you will never forget that about them. That's how basic and foundational gender is. And when you mess around with that, how do you think it affects us as a culture, as a thinking? When you take that most fundamental thing away from somebody, when you can't tell a boy is a boy and a girl is a girl, do you realize how damaging and damning that is for a society? That's the first rule. Get people confused. The second rule is get them confused and then enforce this new truth, this relative truth, by force. And that force doesn't have to be governmental force. It could be governmental force, but, 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 but private businesses and media, and they, they do it just as well, sometimes more effectively than, than by the government. Reinforce these new truths in any way that you can, through Hollywood, through news, through media, through social media, through private businesses. Right now, we are in... Uh, Pride Month, Gay Pride Month, or whatever it's become now, it's LGBT Month, and in and, and the time we've been celebrating this, I've never seen a more focused emphasis on it. Every, everywhere you look, you see it now. This month, I, I know they've done this in past years, but I've never seen it so out in front. People are changing their logos, they're putting a rainbow flag here, people wearing pins. Everywhere you look, you know, Nickelodeon's changing their name, it's got the flag in it, and, and athletes, and, and, and baseball games, everywhere you see it, it's, 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 it's so emphasized. Change people's thinking. And if you can't get with the new program, we're going to kick you off our platforms. You're not allowed to, you're not going to be allowed to be on the internet, on YouTube or on Facebook or whatever it is now. We're going to kick you off because you can't get with our new ideas. We're going to put you in jail. There are people in jail who have misgendered people. It's a crime in some places to misgender people. We're different biologically. It's ridiculous that we have to say that. We're not only different, we're different physically. Have you noticed? Have you noticed? Imagine, imagine that the, the youngest of children can figure out, I have a different setup than my sister or my brother. And say, no, 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 you're totally wrong. Can you imagine confusing someone at that level, understanding that fundamental thing, when they figure that out for themselves, how their bodies work and who they are, to, to immediately at that juncture put confusion. How does that play out when that person turns older and older? If you're confused about the most basic things, we are different physically. Our bodies are very differently. We function differently. Just recently, you probably saw some news. A man has set all of the women's weightlifting records. All of them. In, in, a, in a regular meet, a man who identifies as a woman, he, just in one meet, set like 20 weightlifting records. Wow. Are women getting stronger? Is this what's happening? No, we are. where are the feminists? Where are the feminists to step up and say, no, we're not going to allow men to take over women's sports? Not a lot, but they don't stand up. They're afraid to speak. Because again, we go back to that rule number second, that they enforce this truth by, by force, whatever it might be, and they're afraid of that force. We're not the same. It, it's, World, it's World Cup week, the, the Women's World Cup, and they've been successful. And it's great to watch the women's soccer team do well. But I, I just read an article that they did a, a scrimmage against the under 15 and under boys in Dallas a boys' soccer team, 15, eight, 15 years old and younger, beat our World Cup championship soccer team, Women's World Cup. But they beat them, under 15 and under, five to two. How does that happen? Well, it happens very easily. God made our bodies different. Men excel in some things physically with strength. Women excel in other things. We're not the same. There's all a list. I gave this list at the men's retreat, and they made fun of me because I couldn't pronounce some of these things. So I took those things out. <laughs> hippocampus. Hippocampus is no longer in here. 
We're different. Men have thicker skin. We have denser bones. We have stronger tendons. We have more muscles and stronger muscles. We, we rebound quicker from exhaustion. We have more red blood cells. We have larger organs. We're more sensitive to cold. Men are usually bigger, stronger, faster. We have deeper voices. We have squarer faces. We have more hair, except on our head. A lot of times we lose that, and the women don't. We have weaker vision. We have a weaker memory than women. We have fewer taste buds. I didn't know that. We have fewer taste buds. We are more prone to almost every illness known to man. We die earlier and more often. We're different. Does this make men better? No, no, of course it doesn't. It makes men different. It doesn't make us better. No, it makes us different. And differences are good. That's how God designed us. He's a creative God. We're different intellectually and emotionally. Our brains are different. Men have more gray matter. Women have more white matter. I don't know what that means, but our brains look differently. Men are more fact-based in their approach to the world. Women are more intuitive approached. They perceive people more deeply than men do, and they have a greater memory uh, and connections emotionally with people. Men's brains gravitate more towards facts and logic. Women's brains gravitate more to intuition and emotion. You put the two together, and you have something greater than its parts. You have something better. You have balance. That's why marriage is so amazing. Men's brains rest at a, a, a very slow rate. There is very, they put, the, they put those things on your head and then they say, okay, just rest. Try not to think about anything. And then the man's thing goes, and they say to the women, now you, this is true, I'm not even trying to, be, now, beep, 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 beep. no, 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 I told you to rest. Don't think about anything. Beep, 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 beep. And, you know, this is why men can, and this is, this is scientific, can literally think about nothing. And if you're a man, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's one of the greatest things about being a man is you can sit down and you can really think about nothing. So when you ask him, what are you thinking about? And he says, nothing. He's being honest. <laughs> I'm not. I'm really not. I, we have an ability to just sort of shut down our thinking. It's great. It's a great thing. Women have a harder time with that. Men process things differently in this world than women do. That's why marriage is so great, because now you bring two people together that see things differently, and they can help each other. Your husband helps you as a wife see things, and wives, you help us as husbands say, I didn't know that, I didn't think of that, I didn't see that in that person, I didn't perceive that, I didn't pick up on that, because we're different. Why this push to be the same? Why this push to be interchangeable? The only thing I can think of is people are trying to destroy the image of God, the unique image of God that's in each of men and women. We're different physically, emotionally, mentally. We're different spiritually. We each reflect God differently. How boring it would be if we all reflected God the exact same way. We don't. We reflect God differently, and that's good. We have different strengths. We have different spiritual strengths. We have different spiritual roles. We need each other's differences. We're made to need each other's differences. Adam was created first in creation. He's the head of the marriage. He's the head of the house. Eve was created to be Adam's helper, Adam's partner. That's how God designed it. It's not a negative thing to say that. Wives in the Bible are called the weaker vessel. They are, for more honor, they're weaker vessels physically. 1 Peter 3, 7, likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, in a loving way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel that God made for you to complete you in marriage. Husband, your role, if you are a husband or father, is to physically and spiritually provide for your wife and to protect your wife. You can't advocate that role. You can't give that role up. That's the role that God designed in you. And wives, your role is to partner with your husband, work with your husband in that task that he's been given. And together, you are greater than the parts. We are to complement one another. We are to complete one another. Praise God, we're different. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. And marriage is wonderfully made. Stop trying to make us the exact same. Stop. This is what the culture's pushing, this radical equality, which isn't equality, it's sameness. They use the word equality, but they mean sameness. And it's creating radical division in our world. It's splitting people apart, because if we're not exactly the same, if we're not exactly the same as men and women, then that means that, that one party, the woman usually, is being oppressed and suppressed, and she's the victim of the man, because we're not exactly the same. So if we're not exactly the same, society, men, toxic masculinity, something is oppressing the woman. No, we're not meant to be exactly the same. We're meant to be equal, but we're not meant to be the same. 
And it's so sad when you look at these feminists, and, and, and feminists, are, they say they're trying to be equal with men, they're trying to be the same as men, and for whatever reason, the, 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 the characteristics they take from men are all of our bad characteristics. We want to be just like men, and what they end up taking is all of our bad characteristics. It was men that were selfish and, 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 and ruled a lot of times by their sexual desires. It was men that would walk out on marriages. These were the bad characteristics of men, and that's what the feminists have taken. Eight out of ten divorces, they are not initiated by the husbands, they're initiated by the wives. The hookup culture, the, 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 the way we're living, the, the way that the sexual is happening is, is a lot being driven by women now because they've taken, they want to be like men, and the one way they want to be like men is in their perverted, stupid sexuality that men struggle with. Hey, we want to be like men. Let's struggle with the same things they struggle with. We are different, and it's good that we're different. God made us that way. It's the first thing. We are created in God's image. We are created different. The second thing I want to say about men is men are created to be lords over creation. We are under lords. We are, God has made us and he has given us. He defines who we are. We just said that. He defines what we do. He defines what we do. Genesis, to go on, chapter 1, verse 28. He makes us in his image and God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue the earth and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the every living thing that moves on earth. And God said, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth and every tree with seed and its fruit has been given to you. You shall have them for food and to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life. I have given every tree plant, every green plant for food. They are yours. Every animal, every plant, every tree has been given to you. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. This is what we call the cultural mandate. God gives this to all people on earth. They give, he gives us a command, a mandate to rule and subdue the earth and to be fruitful and multiply. Adam is the head. He's been given this task, and Eve is his helper that helps him in this task, partners with Adam to complete the cultural mandate. Read this very clearly, and you will see that the earth was given to man, to mankind. The earth is ours. It's not the other way around, okay? It's not the other way around. The earth is for us, okay? We have dominion, and we have authority over this earth. The earth is is not better without man on earth. This is, that's the, the cult of environmentalism that we hear about. We are not to live along with the earth. The Bible does not say live in harmony along with the other things in the earth. Live with earth. No, the Bible says clearly you have been given dominion and rule over the earth. The earth exists for us. We do not exist for the earth. Watch out for the cult of environmentalism. This isn't what I'm talking about today, but it's important to point this out. Another article I read today, it's sort of funny, that in, in National Glacier Park, right, this, this beautiful park with the, with the glaciers in it, they had a sign up for years that said, there will be no glaciers in this park by 2020. That's the sign they've been promoting for decades. They had to take the sign down. You know why? Because the glaciers have grown 25%. Beware those who say that the earth is, is better without man. That the earth is, that, that we need to fit ourselves to the earth. No, 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 no. We rule and subdue the earth. By the way, the earth has an expiration date. It's going to be destroyed one day, and we're not the ones who are going to destroy it. God's the one who's going to destroy earth and make a new earth. Remember that. Nancy Percy in her book, Total Truth, says, The first phrase of the cultural mandate, be fruitful, multiply, means to develop the social world. Build families, churches, schools, cities, governments, laws. The second phrase, subdue the earth, means to harness the natural world. Plant crops, build bridges, design computers, compose music. This passage is called the cultural mandate because it tells us that our original purpose was to create culture, build civilizations, build families and churches, nothing less. There's two parts to this, this mandate that we've given. The first is to be fruitful and multiply. See that in verse um, 28, blesses them and said, be fruitful and multiply. Let me break that down to you in a very simple vernacular. He says this, get married, have sex, and have a lot of babies. That's a good command. That's God's first command to us. Go out, get married, have sex, have babies. That's God's good command. And I am pleased to tell you that David's church has been obeying this command very well. Very, very well. 
Maybe overzealously. I've even seen some babies carried out today already. We have a lot of babies here because we have families here that are obeying the cultural mandate. You would not say that, honey, let's get married so we can obey the cultural mandate. You don't put it that way, but that's what you're doing. God told you to do this. He told all people, go out, get married, be committed to your husband and wife, have children, raise families. This is good. This is pleasing to God. Marriage and family is God's great good, and it is expected and commanded of 99% of all people. It's the commanded of all people, 99% of all people. Singleness is not the ideal. It is not commanded in the Bible. It's not something that we should be promoting, singleness. Marriage is what we should promote. Singleness is acceptable in some circumstances. It's not bad to be single. It can be bad if you're disobeying God, but some people are called to be single. Jesus was single. Paul was single. But 99% of us are called to fit into Genesis chapter 1 and be fruitful and multiply and to be married. One of the problems with our culture today is the rapid rise and acceptance of singleness. It's in the church of Jesus Christ. Books are being written in the evangelical church. Pastors are preaching the goodness of singleness. No, that, that's not, that is a misunderstanding of the Bible. We are too in 99% of all cases get married and be fruitful and have children. We're seeing the rise of cohabitation. We're seeing the, 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 the rise of widespread pornography. People are, are, are finding different and, and illegitimate uses of their sexual desires, not in marriage, but in other ways. We're seeing the rise of a hookup culture, of a, of a, of a, uh, of a culture without marriage. Less and less people want to be married today. You pull young people and you will see the drastic decline of people who want to be married or are planning to be married. We're getting to the point where you might say, you know, my goal in life is to be married. They might look at you like you're crazy. What? No, 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 sister. Go out and get a job. Make six figures. Get a big house. Enjoy yourself. And then you can find a man or find many men and you can, you can fulfill your sexual desires. But, but marriage? What are you doing, dude? It's a waste of time. Why shackle yourself with one woman? Women give it away so easily right now. You don't need to be married. You can do whatever you want with women because they're, they're free. They're just like men now. They act just like us now. Men, women were, I'm getting preachy now. Women were always the great gatekeeper of sexuality. It was the women who policed a lot of that and made sure that men waited till they got married. That was how society, that's gone now. Men were usually the sexual aggressors. No longer, they're, they're equally aggressive. So you put two, two young people together, they're both equally sexually aggressive. What's going to happen? What's going to happen is marriage is going to be less and less important to people. The church of Jesus Christ needs to be vigorously promoting biblical marriage and biblical family. Vigorously promoting to our young people that God's design for you is to be married, to be fruitful, to have families, to, 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 to glorify God in that arrangement. We should be promoting that, not promoting singleness. And yet we are. So we need to hold fast. This is the ideal. Again, it's not for all people. Some people are called to be single. But, the, but marriage, because we see it in Genesis chapter 1, uh, we'll see it in chapter 2, when, when God brings Eve to Adam, we'll see that in a minute, but marriage is the, the foundation of, of culture, of world, of society. It's the, marriage is the most stabilizing force in, in the world. God designed it that way. He designed it to, to, especially for men, it stabilizes men. It makes men greater than they could ever be by themselves. They need marriage to be men. Men need marriage. Most men, I should say, need marriage to be men. It's a stabilizing force. You can't mess with it. Even communism didn't mess with marriage. They knew better. We'll mess with religion. We'll mess with, we'll, we'll do all, but we're not going to mess with marriage because it's so foundational to a society. You mess with marriage, you are messing with everything. And yet here we are. In 2019, we think we've arrived that we can rearrange what God designed at creation. It's not ours. This country was founded in 1776. Marriage predates this country. But what right do we think we have to take something that's not even ours? That we inherited from other generations, that we inherited from Genesis chapter, and then start messing with? Who are we? Who are, what nation are we that we think we're so smart and so that we can take something that God created, something that's as ancient as civilization itself, and say, well, we can fix this and make it better? What in the world? How does God judge that kind of hubris, that kind of pride of man? What happens to a culture who thinks that they can do that, can stand and spit in the face of God and say, we know better than you on these things? What do you think happens to a culture that does that? We're about to find out.
It's God's idea. It's created for all people from creation, not just for Christians, not just for Jews, for all people. It's God's great blessing and gift to all people. You know, the church of Jesus Christ will, will be very soon the only place where you see God's plan for marriage and family played out. Pretty soon. Churches will be like museums. Come on, grand, come on, grandson. Let's go to th- this 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 church and 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 this is how old people, ancient people, used to live. This is how they used to do it back in the back in the hundreds of years ago. People would get married and they'd have families. They lived together. Man, isn't that weird, son? They wouldn't even say that anymore because that's probably gone. But but churches are the only place where you're going to see what God intended for this world to be. Churches are going to be the last place you're going to see these things. That's how we were created to fulfill the cultural mandate. The first part of that is to be fruitful and multiply. The second part of that in verse 28 is to subdue the earth, have dominion over it, to subdue and rule over the earth. Go out, get married, have babies, fill the earth and and subdue the earth. Use the earth. Use these resources to glorify me. Use them. Rule over the earth. This is given to men. You can see this from a very early age if you have a boy or you have a grandson or a great-grandson and you will see that he's very different than your, your daughter or your granddaughter or great-granddaughter. They do things very differently. Very differently. And you can't always figure out why boys do certain things. Why do boys dig in the dirt? Why do they play in the mud? Why do they take things apart? Why do they build forts everywhere out of cushions out of, and trees? Why do they climb trees and jump out of trees? Why do they get on swings and see how high they can go and jump off? Why do they take such crazy risks? Why do boys gravitate to playing war? We've tried to drill this out of our young people for, for decades, and they still do it. You know these stories, right? They, people get all upset when kids play war and they take all the guns and all that from them and then some kid takes a graham cracker, he bites it into a gun and he starts shooting his friends with it. <laughs> you, you can't unprogram this. Where's he getting this from? Where's he getting this from? Why does he do that? I'll tell you why he does it. Because he is practicing fulfilling the cultural mandate. God put that in a young man to do those things. Because one day, he's going to have to provide and protect his wife and his family. And here's this young boy, before he even knows what he's doing, he begins to practice subduing and ruling over the earth. He's practicing it. Girls play in different ways, and that's a good thing. Just this week, they were setting up for VBS. There's a lot of people running around and had the opportunity to watch... um, Mom had to go get something to the house. She said, can you watch my kids? I said, sure. And I sat down and they were so I was trying to keep them. I said, just, just don't do anything crazy. And, and there they are. And the little guy, what does he have? He has his farm out. He has all the animals out. These are the animals. He's got the tractor and the farmer's doing a tractor. And we're planting stuff. And what is, what is the girl doing? She's got the dolls. He took the dolls from the nursery. What are they doing? They're practicing fulfilling the cultural mandate. It's nothing to be ashamed of. That's how God made us. Why do we have to be the same? Why is that somehow derogatory to women that they they want to take care and nurture a a family? Why is that derogatory to them? Why do they feel less? Because that's how God made them. And somehow look up to God, look up to men, and and it it makes no sense. Again, it is is the upside-down thinking of this world. Boys fight. They test their strength. Boys like to arm wrestle and find out who's the strongest, who's the fastest, who's the tallest. Who cares who the tallest is? You don't see girls behaving that way. They make up violent games. They got one ball and two kids. Well, here's the game. It's called kill the man with the ball. (laughs) You don't see girls playing kill the man with the ball. You could give women a thousand years that they would never come up on their own with an idea of football, the sport of football. Men, you give them one hour, they got the idea of let's do this. And we'll just run into each other and see which one is standing at the end of it. Yes, good idea. Good, that's, again, this is the cultural mandate that God has put in us. We do stupid things. Some of you men can already think of the things when you were a kid and the dumb things you did as a kid. You, you're lucky. I'm not even exaggerating. You're lucky to be alive. Some of the things you did. I remember there was a movie called Teen Wolf, and in the movie, he'd turn into a wolf and get up on top of the car, and he'd ride the car while it was driving. I said, we got to do that. That's a great idea. So we're up on top of the car driving. Okay, a little bit faster, a little bit faster. We're balancing on top of the car. How stupid is that? <laughs> Daring each other. I remember sitting on a, on a railroad trestle at 3 o'clock in the morning. My buddy said, I dare you to jump off this railroad trestle. There's water down there. Yeah, I dare you to jump. But it's a da- and I jump, and, and the water was like two feet deep. <laughs> stupid things. Lucky to be alive. We could compare stories. All you guys have these kind of stories. Why? Because, again, we're practicing our task to fulfill the cultural mandate that God's in placed in our hearts. 
Men are the lords of creation. We work alongside God to subdue and rule over this earth. But we can only do, men, we can only do it with our partner. God made this, this mandate for both of us. We need our wives. We do this together. We work together. Okay, that's how he made it. You're going to rule and subdue this earth, but you're not going to be able to do it alone. You need to have someone who's going to work with you, a partner, help me. Someone's going to complete you and work with you. We are lords of creation. The third thing we see is men are made to be workers. Men and women are workers. We work differently, but we are made to work and glorify God in our work. Don't you love this picture? I love this picture. This is a famous picture. Genesis 2.15, jump ahead to the next chapter. The Lord God took the man and he put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. Two important verbs, to work and to keep. Okay, this is sort of like the cultural mandate played out in the garden. He is to work and to keep. You were put in the world, in your garden, whatever, in your context, and your goal as a man is to work it and keep it. And you will be held responsible for your working and your keeping. First thing we're called is to work. We're called to labor, to grow things, to cultivate, to take raw materials like God did. God came down and he reached into the ground, the dust of the earth, right? And he scooped up dirt and he breathed into dirt. He made a man. If you could see God that moment and you saw his fingers, he'd have dirt underneath his fingernails. He got dirty. He worked. He took the the soil. He took creation and he made something of value out of it. That is the essence of work, that you are taking something and you are making something good out of it. That's what work is. We're mimicking God when we work our field. We are acting like him. We are contributing to the common good. We are making something useful, something good, something beautiful. We're taking raw materials and we're producing something good. That's what the essence of work is. And we are called to work whatever field God's placed you in. Wherever he's placed you, you are to do that. Act like God and work like God. Men are made for work. God made us to work. Men like to work. Some men like to work too much, and it becomes an idol for men. We like to work. We want to work. Our bodies are created to work. We've been made strong so that we can endure burdens, so that we can do physical labor as men. Get a bunch of men together, and, and inevitably they will be drawn to work. They will begin talking about work. Nothing draws men together more than watching someone else work. What's he doing over there? What's he using? What kind of tool is that? Is that what is that? Is that a DeWalt? What's he got? Is that a Phillips head screwdriver? What kind? No, that's not. Yeah, he's doing that all wrong. You know, he, he, we, we're drawn to work. You see somebody working, and then all of a sudden all guys get together and they start, what's he fixing? What's he building over there? Hey, let's go over there and see. They're putting up a new barn. Let's see how they're doing. Let's see what's going on. Men are drawn to work. We like to, to watch work. We like to critique work. I heard a comedian say that's why they put uh, in the city, where they board up, they put those holes in the thing so you can look through and see what they're doing in the construction site. Because guys want to see what's going on in there. What, what's, what is that? Here, like, is that, or what are they doing in there? We're drawn to it. When you meet a new man, the first thing you ask, what's your name? What's the second thing you ask? What do you do? What do you do for a living? What do you work at? Even, even men's hobbies are work usually. And women's hobbies too. But you know, you, you go home, I can't wait to go home so I can, I can build that deck. Or I can't wait to get home so I can fix my car. I've been tinkering around with my car. I'm getting this thing ready. That's work. People get paid to do that. I like to do that. I do that for free. Our hobbies are work. We like to work. Men need to work unless they are prohibited for some reason. They need to work. First, Second Thessalonians 3.10, if anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. Paul's saying this is, this is what you should be doing. You should be working. And if you don't work and you're able to work and you refuse to work, then you shouldn't eat. That's a pretty bold statement. It's a pretty bold statement. Men respect work. Men don't respect work other men who don't work. They don't, when they could work. Men, men respect men who, who have an excuse not to work because of physical disability or some reason, and they go and work and say, man, that, that's, that's something. See this guy? We had a guy in my last church, Danello. He could barely speak English. He had, a, he had a messed up foot. He had like a club foot, so one of his shoes had that big thing on it, and he couldn't walk. He was all messed up. And he used to ride his bike, what, like five miles a day to get to ShopRite so he could put the carts. He was the cart guy five miles every day. And he was, how old was he? Sixties. Barely speak English. Couldn't walk. It was messed up. The doctor says, you got to stop working. You're, you're messing up your whole body. Your whole, you're not going to live much longer. And he went to her and you look at this guy and said, man, I respect that. 
He has every reason and excuse to stay home and not work. In fact, that's probably what he should do. But he was compelled. Why? Because God put in him the cultural mandate that says you will work it and you will keep it. And he knew that. He did it. You respect that. You respect men who do that, who work hard. It doesn't matter what they're doing. You respect the man who, who, who digs ditches for a living. You respect that. Sometimes you respect that more than the guy who makes millions of dollars switching numbers around an account somewhere. Men respect work. Men are to work to support their wives and their families. Men provide and protect so a wife can do the most important work, and that is the work of raising a family. That's ideal, isn't it? Not everyone can get to that, but the ideal is that mom can stay home and raise the children. That's the most important work, raising children, fulfilling our cultural mandate of being fruitful and multiplied. I don't understand why feminists feel less worthy, less equal, if they can't go out into the world and work. I don't understand that. Because men are to work and provide so that the, the wife can say, and do the real important work of raising the children, of providing that family. Why is one seen as more important as the other? What's more important? What's more important? The raising of your kids or the, the work that you do that gets you a paycheck? What's more important? Your kids. And yet we look down on that. We look down that, that that's less than, than what I do because I go out in the world to work. I don't get that. But again, that's the, the result of sin and the fall and our messed up thinking. Men work. Men also keep. They are put in the garden to work and to keep. The second thing is to keep. That means to protect, to sustain, to care for, to keep safe. A man's job is to guard and protect his wife, to guard and protect his family, to guard and protect his neighbors, to guard and protect his nation. In that order, men are the, men, are the ones who go to war. Women don't go to war. Men are the ones who go to war. Men are the ones who lay down their lives. The keeping, the, 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 the keeping motivation that God places in every man's part is the reason men died on D-Day because they were fulfilling that keeping part. I am made by God, created by God, where they could express that and realize that to keep, to keep people safe, to keep people that I love safe, my family, my wife, my nation, my way of life, my culture. I will go and I will die for that. Why? Why would anybody do that? Why would anybody do that? You think cynically about it, and it's almost ludicrous. Why would anyone die for, for a nation, for a way of life? Why? Because God has implanted in the heart of men a keeping. You are to keep. You are to, to, to watch out for and keep safe those that you love. If necessary, you are to die for that. That, that God gave us that. God made us to, to keep. It's the way God made us to fight and to sacrifice for those that we love. We reflect God in our keeping. Psalm 121, it's in your bulletin or on your app. You see all through there that God is the one who keeps us. Men reflect God by keeping. So when you think of a man when the, in this part of being a worker, men have in one hand the plow and in the other hand a sword. I, almost, I, I thought about maybe getting that up on stage, but we have so much other stuff on stage. You know, I didn't want to do that. You know, a plow and a sword, that's, that's a picture of a man. In one hand, he plows, he works, he provides. In one hand, he has a sword, he protects and he guards. That is the way that God has made you. This isn't machoism. This isn't, this isn't sexism. This is, this is the way God made us. You have a problem with it, you take it up with Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. This is how we reflect God. Our job is to make sure that our wives and our families are safe and flourishing. And when our wives and families are safe and flourishing, then our churches and our communities and our culture and our nation will be safe and flourishing. Reverse it. When we don't do it on the basic level, all the others will suffer. Men are made to work, to work and to keep. Men, fourthly, are made to be husbands and fathers. To be husbands and fathers. Chapter 2, verse 18. Then the Lord God said, it's not good that man should be alone. Remember, this isn't a perfect culture, a perfect, a perfect place. No sin, nothing, and yet there's something not good. Every day, Jesus said, good, 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 very good. That was the last day, very good, and now God says, something's not good. It's not good. I didn't make Adam to live alone. Adam needs to be completed by a perfect partner. He needs a wife. Verse 24, a man shall leave his father and mother. This is before fathers and mothers were even around. This was just Adam and, he will, and Eve and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. Men, most men, let's be careful here, not all, most men have to become a man. You don't automatically become a man. There's a becoming. There's something that has to happen. It doesn't happen automatically. In a lot of ways, women are women. They, they, they don't need to become women. 
But in a lot of ways, men need to leave and cleave. They need to leave their family. They need to leave the authority of their father and the love of their mother. They need to cleave that and they need to cling to a new life. That's the becoming of a man. Women are not commanded to leave and cleave. Men are. There's a becoming that has to happen with men. Men, by and large, do not function well without a wife. Generally speaking, single men are dangerous, by and large. Single adult men are dangerous. Go to China, where they've tried to have the one-child policy. They have this huge population of men and not enough women. What happens when there's not enough women to marry? Men go nuts. They go crazy. They get violent. They get angry. They turn to drugs and alcohol. They turn to pornography and illegitimate uh, sexual expressions. They become violent and toxic. Single men are not something you want a lot of in your society. Because it's, it's the wife, it's the marriage that balances the man and makes him a man. It's a toxic man who's a single man, who uses women for his own sexual gratification, who lives for his own selfish, lustful desires. That is an evil man. That's a toxic man. Men need women to complete them, to, to make them men, if I can say that. And right now we have single men who are saying it's okay for single and, and they're looking for helpers because God made us incomplete. He made us for helpers. It's not good the man should be alone. So even if you're single, you're looking for something to complete you, but you're not looking to your wife. What are you looking to? You're looking to pornography. You're looking to video games. You're looking to work. You're looking to something else to fill that need. I have a need to be complete of something. I need a helper. I need a help meet. I need a partner. And you're looking for illegitimate partners and help meets. That's what's happening in our culture. Men are not good alone. Secondly, men need a helper. We need someone fit for us. Verse 18 goes on. It's not good that man alone. Therefore, I will make a helper fit for him. He needs a, a yin to his yang, right? He needs to be complete. He's, he's got a missing piece, a puzzle piece, that he's not complete yet in most cases. The word helper literally means according to the opposite of him. According to the opposite of him. Someone just like him, but according to the opposite of him. Man was given this task, the cultural mandate, go out in the world, subdue the earth, be fruitful and multiply. Hey, you can't be fruitful and multiply without a spouse. It doesn't work. You need, a, you need a yin to your yang to be fruitful. You can't do that alone. You need to be complete. I've given you a command, and that's to be fruitful and multiply, but I haven't given you the means to that command yet. And the means to that command is your perfect partner, your wife. That hasn't come yet. I've given you a command and you want to fulfill that command. And he brings the animals to Adam to figure out what's going on. Adam says, none of these fit. I cannot be fruitful and multiply with any of these things you brought to me. Not to be crude. And God says, exactly. I haven't made, I haven't made the one who completes you yet. Your bride. Your wife. You're, you're incomplete. You can't fulfill. You can't do these things I've commanded you to do without your wife. Man is given that cultural mandate, but he can't do it alone. He needs a wife to complete his task, and a wife needs a husband to help and to partner with to complete that task together. You need a wife to complete that task. She needs you to help you to complete that task. It only works together. And we both fulfill our God-given roles, and we reflect God. By the way, the word helper there is not an inferior. It's not a weak. God himself calls himself the helper of man. The Ezar, that's the Greek, the Hebrew word, the Ezar. It's not derogatory, it's not less. Helper, you think of that word, well, that means less, they're not equal. And that's not what that word means because God would never say he's less than man. God would never place himself under man. So when God calls himself helper, we know that that's an equal thing. So when you read that as a wife, don't think of yourself in a derogatory way. You are equal, it's, it's a, different in role, a different, different category of roles. Thirdly, men are the head of the wife. Husbands, I should say, not men. Men are not the husbands. Men, this is good to point out, um, men are not the head of women. Husbands are the head of wives. Remember that, okay? This is about the marital context in marriage. Just because you are a man does not give you authority over all women, okay? That's not, this is husbands over wives. Verse 19, now out of the ground, the Lord formed every beast of the field. He brought him to Adam, see what he would call him. Whatever the man called each living creature, that was his name. Adam gives names to all the livestock, but no one was, a helper was not fit for him. Verse 21, God caused him to fall into a deep sleep. 
And while he slept, he took one of his ribs, closed up its place with flesh, and the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman, and he brought this beautiful, perfect creation, the crowning achievement of God's creation. Eve brought it to the man, and the man breaks out in song, which is what you do when you see your, your partner, the person you're going to live with the rest of your life for, someone so beautiful, so much, so much like you, but different than you, that fits you and completes you. This is the last is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. And here we see that marriage that God God, acting as the, the, the father of the bride, brings her to Adam. And, and we see verse 24, man leaves his father and mother before there were father and mothers, and he will hold fast to his wife, and they become one flesh. We see marriage instituted by God. Adam is, is the head. He's the initiator. He is the leader of the marriage and the family. When men give up their role or try to give up their role as the head of the family, things fall apart. That's why, again, that's part of why we are where we are as a culture, because men have tried to give up that role. Patriarchy, which is what's happening here, the, the role of leadership of, of the husbands and the fathers, is God's good plan for humanity. It's not a bad word, although it's almost exclusively used as a bad thing in our culture today. There is bad patriarchy, certainly. Camelia Paglia, she is a lesbian feminist. She's a famous writer, and she is a lesbian feminist, so she has no... She's not in our camp. She's not trying to defend our team. This is what she says in one of her books. One of feminists' irritating reflexes is its fashionable disdain for patriarchal society to which nothing good is ever attributed. But it is patriarchal society that has freed me as a woman. It is capitalism that has given me the leisure to sit at this desk and write this book. Let us stop being small-minded about men. If civilization had been left in female hands, we would still be living in grass huts. That's a lesbian feminist. There's a show on TV, I don't watch it. Maybe you watch, it's called Survivor. They take these people out on an island, they, they have to like, have a competition, you know what I'm talking about, it's a famous show. Um, a couple years ago they decided, well, let's do something new, we'll divide the women from the men, we'll have a women's uh, camp and we'll have a men's camp, right? Maybe you saw this. And again, this is, I'm just reporting what happened. I'm not trying to be funny or anything. But within like a day, uh, the men had huts and they had a, they had a hierarchy of who's in charge. They, they, were, they were fishing, they were bringing food in. And the same day, the women had nothing built. They had eaten all the food that had been given to them and they were basically destitute and they were getting sick. Okay? So they said, this isn't working out. This, uh, right immediately, it's not working out. So they took some of the men and said, you need to go over to the women's camp. What did the men do when they got to the women's camp? They started building things. They started fishing. They started supplying everything. And what did the women do? They sunbathed. They literally sunbathed. The men came over and they took care of everything for the women. And let me tell you about these men. They didn't care that they were sunbathing. <laughs> did they? Men, did they care? That's just what men did. They, men have no problem with providing for a, a woman. In fact, they'll do that. No, no, honey, you don't work. You sunbathe. Let me take care of this. That's how you win a woman. That's how you get a woman. You work for her and you show her how strong and how great you are and how able you are and hopefully she falls in love with you. This is the way of the world. This is the way God made it. Men aren't bitter that beautiful women would, would, would rely on them for their work. They, they encourage it. They would encourage it. That's the way God made us, to, to be the head, this, this patriarchal system. It's good to be a man. You know, on Father's Day, we, we berate men a lot. And on Mother's Day, we lift women up. And, and we should lift women up and moms up. And we should lift men up and husbands. It's good to be a man. God made us this way. And it's good to be a godly man. Let's step up and let's lead. Let's love our wives and protect our wives. Let's love our families and our kids. Let's love our churches. Let's serve our churches and our community. Let's be the kind of men that God made us to be. We need to restore this. We need to get back to this. We're running out of time. Men are saviors. Let me give you this one. We'll, we'll do it briefly. Men are saviors. After sin comes... The promise of redemption, verse 15, that God says, 315, I will put enmity between the serpent and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He, Jesus, this is speaking of Jesus, the prophecy of Jesus, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. That, God, that Jesus is going to crush Satan, he's going to crush sin, he's going to crush death. And how is Jesus going to do this? He's going to do it through a sacrificial death on the cross. He's going to provide himself, and that sacrifice is going to crush the head of sin and death and Satan. As husbands, we are to crush heads. We are to act like Jesus and crush any little head that would raise itself up to harm our wives, our families, our churches, our communities. Our, we are to crush heads. 
We're to act like Jesus and to crush heads. We're not the savior, but we act as a deliverer and a savior of our family to fight and guard for those that we love. We're to crush heads. Secondly, we're to sacrifice ourselves for our wives. This is in Ephesians chapter five. You have that in your bulletin. Husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body. Now the church submits to Christ, so the wives should submit and everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. We are to love our wives, sacrifice our wives like Christ sacrificed himself. Women are not commanded to sacrifice themselves for their husbands. Men are commanded to sacrifice for their wives. And God has put this desire for men to save and to rescue their wives, their families. Uh, wives, you want to give your husband a great gift on Father's Day, give him your submission. Give him your godly submission on this Father's Day. Men are to fight and to suffer, to resist, to sacrifice. Thirdly, men are to present our wives in splendor. It says in verse 26 of Ephesians 5 that Christ might sanctify the church, sanctify her, cleansing her by the washing of water of the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor. Husbands, we are to present our wives in splendor. That's our job. Her confidence, your wife's confidence, her strength, her beauty, her giftedness, her security reflects on you as a husband. We are to present our wives in splendor. 1 Corinthians eleven seven 7 says that women are the glory of man. Protect your wife, provide for your wife so that she can be beautiful and that she can thrive. That reflects on you as a husband. All right, men of David's. God has made you a man in his image. We should act like it. God has made you a Lord over creation. Be fruitful and subdue the earth and rule over it. God has made you a worker. Work hard. Guard your family well. God has made you a husband and a father. Love and lead your family well. God has made you a savior. Step up and deliver and save and fight for your family. Let me just leave you with one image here. And hold on, I know I'm on overtime. We're in overtime here. Um, in conclusion, I, I, yeah, I read this story, which I think really is apropos for Father's Day. I don't know if you've heard this term, rewilding. Maybe you've heard of this, rewilding. This is the idea where, where uh, people are trying to get uh, nature back to its original state, its good state, because of things that have happened, and they're trying to rewild parts of our, of our, of our wooded area and, and, and our parks and things. And in 1995, here's an example. In 1995, in Yellowstone National Park, they reintroduced wolves. You see a wolf up there. 1995, wolves had not been part of, of Yellowstone National Park for 75 years. They, they had been hunted out of existence, and, and they, they brought wolves back in 1995. When they bring wolves back, wolves are predators, right? And they, predator, they, they prey on certain types of animals. They kill certain type of animals, but in killing certain animals, wolves allow other animals to thrive. The wolves killed the coyotes off, and when the coyotes were killed off, the rabbits and the small animal population grew. And when the small animal population grew, that attracted more hawks, which used the small animals for food, and badgers and foxes and other small animals like that were attracted into the park. Wolves kept the deer population from overpopulating, which caused overgrazing to stop, which caused flower, flora, and fauna, flora and fauna to, to grow. Berries and shrubs came back into the park, which caused healthier animals because now they had the, the, a healthier food source. Within six years of the wolves being repopulated, the trees were growing stronger, were growing bigger and taller. Even the trees, barren valleys were teeming with life. Songbirds returned to the park. Beavers began to build dams, which also brought in different types of animals and restored natural habitats for fish and for ducks and for otters and other things. Even the behavior of rivers changed and soil erosion stopped. The, the introduction of wolves back into their natural environment impacted and had a great ripple effects in, in Yellowstone National Park. What do I mean by that? I mean, we need to rewild godly men back into our culture, just like we put wolves back into the natural. We need to put men who love God and and live by this Bible, we need to reorder creation the way it was meant to be by the biblical order. To bring godly men back to where they should be, husbands and fathers and men, to be rewilded into this church, to be rewilded into our community and our nation, to step up again. And when that happens, it will have great ripple effects on our church, on our community, in our neighborhood, in our culture. For too long, men, we have allowed ourselves to be demonized, to be feminized, to be emasculated, to be dismissed as toxic. We've, we've shied away from that. We've been scared, and we've become weak. We've become weak and unbiblical and ungodly men. We have fallen for the lies of the world. 
We've allowed our wives to run our marriages and our churches. We've allowed our children to run our families for us instead of stepping up to be the father and the husband that we're supposed to be, that we're called to be by this book. It's time to be rewild into this community, into this world, into this church. It's time to restore the biblical mandates to lead our marriages, to lead our families, to lead our churches. It's time to be godly men again, to be godly wolves, if you will, for Jesus Christ. The question is, will we step up and do that? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would do that today, that you would bless the men of David's Community Bible Church, that we would stop being weak men, toxic men, angry men, violent men, neglectful men, weak men that that run away, who let others lead when we should step up, that we would stop that, that we wouldn't run to anger and to, to dominate But we wouldn't run away to to submissiveness and to to tune out and to check out either. But we would stay right where you want us in our biblical calling to fulfill the cultural mandate, to love our wives, to provide for our families, and to protect them, Lord. Pray that you you would do that here in the men of David's, that we would lead, that we would be what you have called us to be, what you have made us to be, what you have put into our hearts, Lord, that we would have the courage and the faith to step up and and be those men, to love our wives better and well, to lead our children better and well, to lead our churches and step up to lead them well and better, Lord. It all starts right here, and I believe it all starts with men. I pray that you would do that for us. I pray that you would do that for us, Heavenly Father. I pray this in your name. Amen.